of the grave Break into the wild And don't be afraid Run into wide open spaces Grace is waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom, there is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom, there is freedom Come out of the dark just as you are
God for freedom. There is so much freedom. You know, through all the chaos and noise in the world, God can still hear the whispered prayer of his child. This next song that we're going to do, I was looking at the words, and this song is so powerful. Graves into gardens. Just think about that. And it says that he will turn your mourning into dancing. I mean, that is just, just think about that. It reminds us that weeping is temporary. But with Jesus, joy always comes. Joy always comes. Glory. 
think we should just keep clapping if you believe that. that I just really like that song a lot. Um, you guys can grab a quick seat if, if you guys are here with us or online and this is your first time or your hundred and first time. We really just want to drive home this concept of welcome home. That's something that we believe um, wholeheartedly that you belong here before you ever believe anything. And that's something that we um, as a church strive to create a culture of is just that you are welcomed here, that we are so excited that you're here. Um, my kids in the room, we have some friends in the back that are ready to go hang out with you. Um, so if you are four to fourth grade, adios. Have fun, be loud, be crazy, make a mess. Don't tell your parents. <laughs> Except my kids, you better behave. So, um, like I said, we're super, super thankful that you are here. If you are online or in the room, you can go to nrcc.church slash connect, or there is a card in the seat back in front of you. And we encourage you to fill those out, whether in person or online. If you're here, drop it in the black box on the way out. We would love to hear part of your story, see what your next step is, see how we can pray for you or help you in any way, shape or form. Um, and I'm, I want to take a brief second to, to highlight giving. And then we have a couple other things. I'll tell you about the note cards on your chair. If your kids haven't destroyed them or turned them into a paper airplane, like my son. Um, but we just want to thank you. Um, thank you for those who partner with us, who believe in the mission of this church and of the gospel just to go forward and go out. And so if that's you, if you partner with us monthly, weekly, yearly, once a time, 40 times, we just want to say thank you. Like we never want to forget to thank the people who partner with us because you help put movement to what we're doing here. You know, we can cast vision and we can create vision and we can come up with these amazing ideas, but you guys help bring those to life. And on the screen behind me, there's all the different ways to give, but giving really rolls into the next two things that we want to talk about. And the first you saw when you came in maybe um, is a table for serving. Um, that's one of the things that we value as a network and as a church. And we think that you guys will help discover and fulfill your purpose when you serve other people. And when we take the gift that we've been given, the grace, the mercy, the love, the truth that God has bestowed upon us, and we carry it with us, whether that's serving here on Sundays, serving here on Wednesdays, going out in the community. Um, we just think that you find your purpose in we believe in city transformation. We want to see Johnson City changed and we know that that is accomplished through each and every one of us. And so as you leave, there's a table out there with some of the different ministries that are here at church. We would love for you to pick up the Sharpie and we would love for you to put your name down. And then we will contact you and talk about what that looks like. So if you're 50-50, say yes. If you're 25-75, say yes. If you're just thinking about it a little bit, you have this little feeling in your stomach, that's not heartburn, that's the Holy Spirit, say yes. And that leads right into the last thing, the note card that's on your chair. We are super excited about Easter and we are starting a new series in a few weeks and it's called Seven Words. And what we want to do is we want to hear your story. We want you to write about a time when you said yes to God's will instead of your own and the result of that. So you have a front and a back on purpose because we don't want to hear every little detail, but we just want to hear your story. And we want to celebrate those. And then as a church, we're going to do a few different things with those. So on your note card, story, right? When you said yes to God's will, and it could be today, like, oh, I was scared about serving. And I saw, you see what I did there? Yeah, see, two for one deal, two for one, okay? And as you fill those out, if you fill those out today, please, there's two black boxes at the end, just drop them in there. If you're that person who needs to think about it and is afraid of misspelling words, I have one of those at my house. I'm about to sit next to her, no names, because we don't embarrass people. Bring them back, okay? Bring them back with you. We would love to hear your story and share it with you. Pray with me real quick as we jump into the next message in This Is Us. Father God, thank you so much for the people who are here and the people who are watching online with us. And I just pray a simple prayer, God, that you would be with us in these next few moments as we dive into your word and grow closer to you. Um, quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, so that your Holy Spirit can speak to us through your word and through Chris. We thank you for these moments. We thank you for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Hey, good morning. We're stoked that you're here today. If you're a first-time guest, we really want to say welcome home. Uh, we're super glad that you chose to hang out with us, to encounter God with us this morning. If you've came into the room with questions or doubt or problems or pain, you came to the right place because hope lives here, because Jesus lives here, and he wants to speak into all of those areas and concerns uh, within your life. So we're really glad you're here, and again, we just want to say welcome home. I know you may not have noticed when you came into the room, but there's blue chairs kind of interspersed throughout our auditorium, and those chairs belong to the Gray Campus, and this morning our, our, our Gray Campus is meeting for one of their last times. They're celebrating today as they dissolve as one of our Northridge Network churches, and this is what I want to say about that. Not everything God calls to obedience lives. Sometimes he calls things to die and then be resurrected, or some things, things die, and they look different when he resurrects them. And so they've went from the church gathered like us today and then scattered to really now just the church scattered. God has done some amazing things at that campus, 25 baptisms over the past two years. Like they've seen leaders developed. Yeah. They've seen a lot of people take next steps that never would have if they didn't go to gray at that campus to meet the people of God there. And so uh, they're going to be going through a process of healing, through a season of healing and figuring out if they want to connect back with the Northridge Church. And I know some are coming to this campus uh, and then some are just taking a break for a bit and that's okay. So I would love for us just to take a minute to pray for them this morning, that God would heal their hearts, that he would continue to grow in their lives and he would use the giftings that were developed as they took next steps at that wonderful little location in gray. So let's just pray for them this morning. Jesus, thank you for the truth in John 12 where you talk about a grain of wheat falling to the ground and dying. And if, it die, and if it's alone, it dies. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. And so I know that you're going to make good out of a moment that seems sad and, and just confusing. But uh, they're obedient. They're being obedient. And because of that, you'll bless and honor it. Thank you for the leadership who really poured in blood, sweat, and tears into those five years of developing a campus and developing a core team and all the sacrifices that were made to, to reach and make a better contact with people in gray who have never been in an environment like this one we're in today. And so they go from being the church gathered and scattered to the church scattered. And so I pray you would heal hearts. I pray, pray that you would remind them it's not about a leader it's not about a location. It's about the kingdom of God and being flexible to what you call us to and be obedient to what you call us to. I love that they're celebrating today. And I pray that it would be a day that they'll never forget for the rest of their lives and that it brings joy to their minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we are in week three of our This Is Us series and it's based on the popular TV show where they're working through the ins and outs of relationships and we've done the same exact thing as we've talked about singleness and the relationship that is the foundation to all the other relationships, which is Jesus. We talked about that last week and if you've missed any of those weeks, you can catch up on our Northridge YouTube channel. Just type in Northridge WM like, subscribe, share. I'm going to post that message tomorrow with some resources on our Facebook page. But that's where you're really going to get some connections to the messages that we preach previously. And um, today we're talking about marriage, the easiest relationship there is out there. And so if you're not married, man, take notes for your friends that are. If you've been married for a long time and you're in a really rough season or even a short time and having a rough year, uh, I promise what we have today will give you some hope. I love what our lead pastor, Jim Richmond, who's here, by the way, with his wonderful wife, Lori Richmond. You'll see him next week. But Jim said this, there are no guarantees, but it should be that every step of the way, as much as it relies on you, tell your neighbor you, just like you, as much as it relies on you, you should be following what Christ says to do in the dating process, in the engagement process, in the marriage relationship and process, really every step of the way, that you are doing everything you can to let Christ shape you and use you, tell your neighbor you, you, 
in that moment. Because that is, the, people ask, what's the will of God? The will of God is that you would be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, that you would become more like him and less like you. And so through all these relationships, specifically the one you have with Jesus himself, you're to be making those choices and pursuing those desires that Jesus himself wants for you. Because as it becomes part of your life, it becomes a part of every relationship within your life. And so I heard that and thought, man, that's, that's what we really need to do as married people. It's, it's simple and it's right, but marriage can be really rough sometimes. It can be really tough because you're taking two selfish, sinful people. And I know I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your spouse. I'm not talking about her at all. You're taking two selfish, sinful, fallen people and asking them to make decisions together, to make choices together, to do bank accounts together, to raise kids together, to choose what you're doing for the rest of your life together. And it can get kind of ugly, you know, uh, if there's a lack of communication, if there's a lack of a willingness to, to serve the other person. And you have these arguments and it can get kind of difficult to stay on track and to be on mission as God has called us to be, to be following Jesus through all of those moments. And it doesn't help that our marriages can be kind of looking at the comparison trap, you know, on social media because everybody just posts their best shots, right? Their best moments. And Craig Rochelle, I think, says uh, the greatest thief of joy is comparison. When you're looking at what somebody else has and wondering why you don't have it or why it's not like that, they're, they're posting their best stuff. I mean, there's filters and, and there's moments and there's this hashtag relationship goals that, that's out there. And I mean, people are posting their very best moments of their marriage and it makes our marriage look kind of boring. I'm okay with boring, by the way. But it makes it look boring. You know, and we, we begin to think, do I really have the relationship that I should have and within this marriage? And I looked up the hashtag, and this was one of the pictures that came up for relationship goals. And I'm like, do you know what's getting ready to happen to Jack? And maybe they did post that because they're like, and if you've not seen Titanic by this time, too bad, sorry. I'm going to ruin it for you. Jack doesn't make it. But maybe they want their Jack in their life to... to sink to the bottom of the ocean and that's a relationship goal but I thought this looks kind of romantic and it was a romantic moment but maybe you want to change your goals but you know people post what they want you to see without it possibly being a reality in their life and my point is this marriage is tough because of trying to combine two lives together but it's also tough because everyone else's marriage looks better when you look outside the scope and picture of the relationships you're in, and I'll, I'll tell you, we compare often the backstage of our lives to a lot of people's front door with social media and their highlight reel. So I'm hoping today we can be real with each other, that we're not going to base it on the best picture that you posted from the one vacation where you argued all week long and then made up enough to take the picture and post it at the end of the week, relationship goals like one time I had somebody say, you know, you and Kristen, you have the best marriage ever. You know, I wish we could just have a marriage like you. And I mean, I was honored, but I was like, we ain't perfect. We're far from perfect. Like, we just fought this morning. Just kidding. We didn't fight this morning because I left the house at 630. But that kid life, man, you throw in them multiples, it's going to get rough. Um, anyway, I'm glad our... I'm glad our kids are very reserved at this point in their lives. But, but there's been arguments. There's been moments where we question, you know, are we going to make it? There's been thrown objects like, she's the thrower. But just kidding, just a couple of times. Uh, she's not got great accuracy, thank goodness. But let's be real, it's hard. But God speaks into that tension. God speaks into those moments where you kind of want to give up or just stop or, or walk away or start over again without dealing with your stuff or making it about you. Like, let's be real. But, you know, God wants to speak into this tension of marriage and really speak health and love and joy. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote in Ephesians 5 uh, just a great principle 
uh, to married people and even to people in general as he begins in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5. And that's where we're going to go this morning. And again, I pray if you're not married, man, God would encourage you to encourage your married friends with this advice, with these principles. If you are married and you've never really experienced healthy seasons, I pray that you would listen and apply, not just listen and and go on with life as normal. Let me pray and then we'll read. Jesus, uh, we know that we are imperfect And we also know that we are in desperate need of you for any relationship we have, let alone marriage, to work the way that you designed it to work. And so I just pray for the marriages where there's broken trust, where they're kind of ready to give up, that you would give them a glimmer of hope. For the ones that are healthy and really rooted in you, give them relationships to extend their influence and to model it uh, for people who aren't there yet. And for the ones contemplating it, I pray that they would start well with the foundation that we're talking about today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ephesians 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Imagine a world if we did that. Like not just read it, but applied it. That we were placing the needs and and the benefit of other people ahead of ourselves. That would be an amazing kingdom like world that Jesus always has wanted. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to yourselves, to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Here's the easy part, guys. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Not a problem. Very easy. (laughs) To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Now, this is a a passage that has often been mishandled, sometimes misinterpreted, but when you really look at it, it's a part of God's word. Like, it's included in divine scripture. And maybe, just maybe, if we actually read it with an open heart and mind and applied the principles, you would see your marriage change you would see your marriage be more beneficial and more joyful because this is from God, not just in advice or information, but in practical life application. You would see your marriage most likely grow as well. And God is saying, if you want a successful, vibrant, fruitful marriage, here it is. So there's a few things that we can see in the text. And one of the first things that we see is mutual submission. Like too often, you know, this text has often been dumbed down to just, yeah, wives submit to your husbands. And here's the thing, guys are the mostly the ones saying that from stage. Why don't we give our wives the opportunity to read that, internalize that, process that, and apply that? Because it's written to them. Let our wives read what's written to them and let them focus on that. The other thing is this whole passage begins with Paul telling both husbands and wives to submit to one another. Like, to be willing to place the needs of the person that I'm in this relationship ahead of my own. And that that be the focus. Not what you can get out of it, but what you can give. Like, that's what submission is. And that's exactly what Jesus did on this earth. This is mutual submission. And we don't often see mutual submission. We see mutual competition. You know, like, who's tired of who had the longer day? How was, your, how was your night last night? I'm fine. I've been with the kids for six hours by myself. But they ate and were put in bed and Judah was giving his bottle. But I'm fine. How was your time with all your girlfriends for six hours playing bunko? Just kidding. I gave her a hard time. I didn't say anything. I was like, how was your night? I'm fine. But we tend to do that. You know, who's tired or, or who did more? You know, or who invested more time into that thing that we both said that we were going to do together. We have this mutual competition. But what if we started to try to outsubmit one another 
Instead of it being mutual competition, it was mutual submission. And really submitting yourself to the benefit of the other person where you're trying to do more than them. No, you first. No, seriously, you first. No, you, you take the last bite of dessert. She wants to share dessert sometimes. And I'm like, get your own. Like, because I want the whole thing. I don't want to share. And if there's a last bite, she's normally like, here you go. You know, with mutual submission, maybe I'm just like, here you go. Actually, I'd be like, here's your own cupcake. <laughs> I got it just for you, and I don't want any of it. But what if we did that? What if we submitted ourselves to the other person and wanted their benefit and their growth and and their joy more than ourselves? So let's try to submit to one another. He also mentions covenant over contract. Like when you get married, you get this document called a marriage license. If I've done your wedding in the room, just kidding. I, I do a lot of them, and, you know, I do the premarital and then there's the marriage license, and this is the thing that I text the, the guy about. I'm like, don't forget this because it's not legal if you don't bring it. And there has to be a black pen, and if you write in blue, the county clerk will say try again, and you have to go through that process. But it really is like a contract because there's this you know, heaviness of, oh, no, this is real, and this is government issued. And, but you're thinking, okay, they've agreed to do their part. I'm going to do my part. Like, that's what a contract is. We've agreed that we're going to do our parts for this thing to work, which is more like 50-50. But that's not really what a covenant is. A covenant is 100%, 100%. Like, I'm not going to love you if you respect me. Or I'm not going to get something for you if you get something for me. Like, I'm not going to fulfill this need if you fulfill my need. Like, that's, a, that's really like a contract. That's not a covenant. A covenant is all in. A covenant is 100%, 100%, because 50-50, the problem with that is that you've predecided that what you do is directly tied to what the other person does. I, I've seen it not end well when that is the mindset. And, I mean, let's read verse 21 again. Submit to one another as long as he takes out the trash, as long as she does the laundry... And as long as they squeeze the toothpaste correctly. I mean, that's what, that's what we remembered, right? That's not what it says. What does it say? Submit to one another. Reverence for Christ. So the reason that I'm 100% is because I love him. And I respect him. And, and he's worthy of all my life and my praise and everything that has been given to me. And I'm submitting to him. And because of that submission, she's going to get Jesus in and through me. So we're submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's not how we feel. It's not what they've done. But it's because of what Jesus has done and is doing, which is why I can be in covenant with her and give her everything that Jesus has given me, not based on what she has done or not done. We talked about that last week. There's nothing you can do or not do to make me love you more or less. Same thing here with mutual submission and covenant not being as powerful as covenant because you have two imperfect people. Like we acknowledge that, we realize that, and, and the thing is it's not always going to work out or be the same, so I'm choosing covenant. I'm choosing 100% regardless of what happens toward me from her or within our marriage life that may or may not be a good experience. I'm choosing 100% to submit and to love. A contract is 50-50. A covenant is 100-100. not trying to meet you in the middle. I'm not trying to meet her in the middle. I'm going all the way with Christ, for Christ, and because of that, it will benefit her life as well as my family. That's exactly what Jesus did. He was 100% all in, not based on what you do or didn't do. It's all based on what he's already done and is doing. It's a covenant, not a contract. We also see godly submission, like we talked about mutual submission, and we're talking about, you know, a contract versus a covenant. We want to experience covenant love and covenant relationship and covenant marriage. But really with godly submission, we see this in verses 31 through 33. Paul summarizes, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Then the two will become one flesh. And I was looking at that this morning because I was like, what is he really talking about here? He's talking about being like glue, like permanence and unity. Like this covenant that these two people would have between one another with God, it would be permanent. 
And, and their lives would be like glue because when you put something together with glue and you try to peel it apart, there's pieces that are left. And so he's wanting it to remain and to thrive. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ to the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So in simplest of terms, men, love your wives. Wives, respect your husband. In the unique way that God has asked us to submit and to serve and to pursue each other, the greatest thing she can do for me And, I mean, you can look in the card section, and that's why we freak out. Those guys do because it all talks about love, 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 and there's nothing in there about respect. Like, that's where the struggle is. I know that I'm loved when she respects me. And she knows she's respected when I love her. But when I love her, it makes her want to respect me more. And when she respects me, it makes me want to love her even more. We don't get on this vicious cycle, which there's a book called Love and Respect by Dr. Egrich, and we would encourage you to get that. Uh, Her favorite one for marriage is when sinners say I do, mine is love and respect. But this is kind of God's timeline and God's blueprint for us to be able to work together and serve together and love together. It gives us a glimpse of how we're created and that we're different and that we need those different aspects of life and extending respect and love. So what would it look like You know, if you began to just love your wife sacrificially, placing her ahead of yourself, like loving her like Christ loved the church, I guarantee you, and I'm not sure what the relationship status is currently, but she would probably begin to respect you more. And wives, sometimes if you just encourage him with initiative and when he's trying to love and lead your family and when he gets you know, the buttons all buttoned up correctly and you, you know, tell him he's done a great job with them buttons. Like maybe the respect grows within his mind and his heart and he begins to extend love even more. So focus on what God's word is saying to you. For guys, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Ladies, respect your husbands and I guarantee you the love that that God has given him will extend out to you in and through his life. And maybe you're like, Chris, you don't, you don't know my spouse. Like, they are completely different when we leave this space on Sunday mornings. Like, I don't, he doesn't deserve my respect. And maybe the guys are like, you don't know what she's like when we're at home. It, it's hard to love her. And I would say, just try. Try to out-serve them. Try to out-love them. Try to out-respect them. Try to place their needs ahead of yourself and submit to that and and just see what God can do within those moments because for a lot of you, it's going to be faith that drives that choice. And it may not be instant gratification. You know, he's not going to be the poster husband right away. She's not going to be the poster wife right away, but at least you're both pursuing God in the same sense, in the same timeline, and giving him the opportunity to work and do something significant really just takes one of you doing it. And here's the thing, I don't want it just to be like a flare shot up in the air and you kind of see it and then it just dissipates. Like, I want to establish something more like a flame, a foundation that is built on Christ that lasts forever. And you know what's boring? That. Because you know why? When you set up this foundation and you're pursuing Jesus and mutually submitting, this is what it looks like. Anybody ever build a house? Isn't this like the most boring, like, we're going to sit the foundation? But it's the most important. Because if the foundation is off, the house falls. Like, if there's no cornerstone, like, everything crumbles around it. So it doesn't matter what your marriage looks like on the outside. If the foundation isn't secure in Christ, if you're not mutually submitting, if it's not a covenant, if there's not godly submission, it's probably not going to last. You know, we've outgrown our house, and, you know, we're talking about what it would look like to build. And, and we're talking about, you know, expanding our minds because most of the time, you know, when you talk about building and things like that, you're like Pinterest boards and shiplap and paint colors and just what everything's going to look like after this is established. But this is the most important thing. That's not a social media worthy post in a lot of minds or relationship goals, but it is the most essential thing when we're talking about marriage, and that is laying the foundation first. When you understand all the things that we've talked about today, and again, mutual 
submission, covenant, godly submission. You're taking really God's word and you're laying a foundation for your marriage that is built to last. And you're actually providing a platform for something beautiful to be built. And people that are not married yet, like, keep this in mind, the foundation of Christ and, and submitting to one another and covenant, like, those are essential for those relationships. And maybe you've been married for a short time or a long time and you've never heard those things until today. It's never too late to start, to apply those things into your life, lay the foundation first. And here's the thing, we don't think you have enough to live this out. Just remember, God can do a lot with a little. God can bring back the dead. He can restore and revitalize a marriage that began maybe in a good spot or a healthy spot that has kind of looked like it's going to end. So allow God to lead you as husbands and wives into your marriages to establish a foundation to build something incredible and beautiful that lasts forever. Now, me and her, this would be Kristen, if you never met her, my beautiful, intelligent amazing wife um we built our marriage on the foundation of christ like that was essential when we were dating and then we're engaged and i would say the second floor of our house or the first floor was love you know we had established christ as the foundation then we loved each other then trust was the second floor and i made a horrible decision uh in our marriage as a you know an always recovering drug addict. I've been clean for 20 years. You know, I was going through a season kind of anxiety and depression and, and I had some physical stuff going on in my body and, and I just noticed she had some pills from a surgery in her bathroom. And I heard remembered those pills by selling them and making a ton of money when I used to deal the drugs years and years ago. And I just thought, mm, I'll just take one. And then one became three, and then three became five, and then I thought, oh, no, she's going to notice, so I took Tylenol and put it in the pill bottle because she had had surgery. That's how low of a human being I can be. So I hope that makes you feel better. Um, and she asked me, did you take my pills? And, of course, I told the truth. No, I didn't. Why are you? Well, how dare you question me? How dare you ask me that question? And then it just began to eat at me. That's what sin does, like lying. That's, uh, that's what that does. It kills your conscience. And so I just couldn't look at her in the eyes. And, and she asked me again. I said, I did. And I lied to you, and I'm sorry. And she was livid. And I don't blame you. Like, I don't blame her. Like, she was livid. And mainly, not, I don't think it's so much the pills. It was because I lied to her, and trust was broken. And so then she's like, is there any other pills that you've taken? And are you taking, you know, drinking anything in the kitchen? Or like, you know, are you back at a drug? No, no, no. I just took some pills. And so from that point on, she hid any prescription medications somewhere in our house. And then would ask me, have you lied to me about anything? Have you taken anything else? And it was hard. But I had broken trust. There was a crack in the foundation of the trust within our marriage and our life. But thankfully... We began to restore that. You know, we had began to extend respect and love again and transparency and forgiveness and just all of those things that Jesus asked us to do throughout our lives and essentially through our marriage. And, you know, I don't ever want to have a conversation like that again. And I'm thankful that she took the steps and said the words that we would never have to go back down that road again. And so the level of our home, trust, restored, love is good, foundation is Jesus. And so maybe that's where you're at today. I don't know if it's trust being broken. I'm not sure if it's an argument that never ends or just a moment in your marriage and life where you didn't put God first and where he's wanting to work. And that's why that tension is there. Because some things in our life, it has to be him. Restoring and rescuing and recovering those moments and areas of our lives as we do it together. Because we are two imperfect people that are allowing Jesus to work in and through our lives. Because the whole deal with marriage, the reason he created it, is to show the supernatural love of Christ. That's why he says the groom and the bride. Jesus is the groom. We are the bride. Like, 
to give people a glimpse of what supernatural love and forgiveness and restoration looks like when it's being lived out of two imperfect people. As the band comes back up this morning, I want to invite you to ask Jesus to give your marriage relationship a breakthrough. Like, do you need a breakthrough in the area of mutual submission? Do you need a breakthrough in the area of covenant, not contract? Maybe you need a breakthrough in the attitude and reaction of love and respect, because if that is off, there will be a vicious cycle where she feels unloved and you feel disrespected. And when you feel disrespected, you'll not love her. And when she feels unloved, she will disrespect you. Like maybe you need a breakthrough in that area of your life. And maybe you're here today and you have a story like I'm sharing today where trust was broken and it has not been the same. And if you can't trust somebody, I can't see it working. So maybe Jesus gives you a breakthrough to begin that conversation to be transparent, to extend love and respect and to start that foundation again, but build it this time on him. He can, he can break through anything that I just talked about. I love the next song that we're getting ready to sing. It says this, you alone can take my scars, piece by piece restore my heart. Take what's broken, make it whole again. And here it is, your power, your presence, Break strongholds, king of heaven. When you speak, mountains move. I believe there will be breakthrough. He could do anything in your life if you're willing. And maybe it just begins with you. And your spouse sees it modeled and sees it lived out and wants the same thing. Today we have communion available in the back. And what I love about the concept that we're talking about with breakthrough and even with this relationship that sometimes can feel broken, like if you think about the mutual submission of Jesus to the Father through especially the idea of communion that we celebrate, he was broken. He was broken like the bread. And the blood that was shed, like that is ultimate sacrifice. And he mutually submitted to the Father. And what seemed extremely broken provided breakthrough for you and I to have a relationship with God again. So I want to encourage you, especially if you're married today, take communion together. Spend some time to pray and to worship, but take communion together. If you're here today and you just want to thank God for who he is and what he's done in your life. We have communion available back there and communion available back there. And as you pray and as you worship, think about the mutual submission between the Father and the Son and the brokenness that provided something beautiful. A foundation that we build our relationships off of in Christ. Jesus, I pray for breakthrough this morning. I pray for marriages in the room this morning that feel broken and hurt and almost over. Just bring breakthrough, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the power of your word. Begin a new thing, establish a foundation that that relationship can be built on. For the rest of my friends in the room, regardless of where they're at relationally, I pray that you would remind them that it is through your brokenness, through communion through life death resurrection that they have relationship with you god we love you and we give you our lives and our hearts and our dreams in jesus name amen
King of heaven, when you speak, mountains move. I believe there will be
We can celebrate him today. When you read scripture, he calls himself the chief cornerstone. And the chief cornerstone is what's established when a building project takes place for a home or a larger building. But that is the essential piece in the foundation staying and being supportive. And so I would encourage you, if he's not that in your marriage, in your relationships... We'd love to talk to you or encourage you on how that can happen. And 
And really for those of you that are currently married, let him be your enough when you're not. Mutually submit being a covenant with each other and love and respect each other. That's how it works. I'm gonna be sending out a, uh, really some social media tomorrow with some advice with this message with two books that Kristen and I love. I can give you our counselor that we love who helps a lot of marriages. I can give you his information. But if you need some help, like immediately, you can put marriage on that connection card and drop it in the box and I'll connect with you tomorrow morning uh, because we wanna help you in that area of your life. So we're excited to continue this relationship series. We hope that you uh, can come back next week as well. Uh, We'd like to go ahead and dismiss our friends and guests at this time. Um, And if you're a partner or member, we need you to stick around just for a couple minutes. We have some stuff we'd like to share with you. But thanks for being here today. Uh, We'll see you next Sunday.